Let us bust a cap in the grills of all you amateur engineers out there, painting by numbers and reducing complex issues to binary propositions. Because the internet. Welcome to another episode of What The Fact where you throw me the ball and I come running back with it enthusiastically. And then I dry hump your leg in the most platonic possible way, of course. Unless you're a chick. I'm John Cadogan, Director of Dry Humping Outreach Operations here at autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars without once becoming embroiled in some Iliad-esque, in dealership, dactylic hexameter drama. Hit me up on the website for that. The online everything culture has a remarkable ability to disseminate uninformed opinion, and ordinary people get led up the wrong track on the hunt for some required automotive resolution. This happens all the time. Here are just a few examples. Warwick wrote in recently, he says, I'm an elderly driver concerned with what seems to be the trend of dispensing with larger engines and replacing them with smaller turbocharged engines. I'm particularly wary of the merits of turbocharging for cars doing heavy stop-start city driving, particularly in relation to reliability issues. Now sure, I appreciate that it may well be that the turbo may not even operate in these cases and remains idle for long time periods, but perhaps that in itself could be a problem. Is it something we need concern ourselves with? Marcello says, Do you know if the Hyundai i30 comes with a timing belt or a chain and how often does it need to be replaced? And Ian writes in and says, I've owned a 2009 Holden VE Ute from you and I've always had it serviced regularly by Holden dealers. Got the 150,000 kilometre service done last Saturday. The dealer's diagnostic computer reported a timing chain problem. The check engine warning light went off, but has reappeared today. Looking at online forums, it appears that this is a known fault in this model. Some people suggest approaching Holden for a goodwill gesture in contributing to the cost of repair, despite the car's age, as this should be a lifetime part. What should I do? These are really common questions, you know, belts versus chains. I seem to get that all the time. And modern engine technology generally, there's a lot of skepticism out there on that. So let's deal with the specifics of these questions first and then the broader, bigger picture, because there's a forest for the trees visual metaphor going on out there as well. On turbocharging, you know, there's no real evidence that smaller turbocharged engines are any kind of reliability problem, and I'm such a big fan of evidence on this. Yes, turbocharging increases specific power output, so there's more power per unit of swept engine displacement goodness. But that idiot who said there's no replacement for displacement Obviously, this was well before forced induction and direct injection, and of course, microprocessor engine control. In fact, turbocharging saves you considerable fuel by increasing thermal efficiency. So you get more power for each gram of fuel that you burn. It also allows the engine to be smaller and therefore lighter, which delivers further efficiency type savings every day. The nature of turbo operation, especially in concert with modern direct injection systems, means that modern turbocharged engines deliver a great deal of additional low and mid RPM power, which some people often erroneously describe as torque. Executive summary time. Turbo engines are more efficient and better to drive, that's definite. They're very well thought out generally, albeit a little more complex. But there doesn't seem to be profound negative feedback on this. You know, the roadside is not littered with dead turbochargers. But like all components, turbos can absolutely fail, especially if the underlying design or the in-service maintenance is poor. However, there is apparently no epidemic out there of premature turbo failures going on. And therefore, there is no cause for the concern 
noted by Warren. On this issue of timing belts versus timing chains, they both do the same job, which would be precisely synchronizing the cam and valve operation with the rotation of the crankshaft. And this is tremendously fundamental to engine operation. It's so fundamental, in fact, that in a modern interference engine, the failure of either a belt or a chain is gonna mean the pistons slam into the valves at breakneck speed, and the result will be roughly the same for the engine as it would be for you if your wife returns home just one day early and finds you diligently washing the boss's secretary in your bathroom. Good luck putting either mess back together. Belts are typically quieter than chains and they need to be replaced at some manufacturer's specified interval, like 100,000 kilometres or something. Chains usually don't have a specified replacement interval, but they do wear out and the principal wear characteristic for them is stretching. When that happens, if the tensioner literally can no longer pick up the slack, the cam timing just gets retarded and the engine starts to run like a bit of a dog. In Ian's case, the car has done 150,000 kilometres. If the timing chain needs replacing, that's pretty much fair wear and tear. You have to be reasonable. 150,000 kilometres is nearly four laps of the planet. Everything wears out and 150,000 is not an unreasonable life. And personally, I think it's a bit rich to allege that this is a fault. It's actually just a consequence of that chain doing several million laps of the timing case. Certainly it costs nothing to ask for a bit of goodwill from the manufacturer. I mean, the worst that can happen there is that they'll just say no and you'll be back to square one financially, footing the bill yourself. But I don't agree with these so-called forum experts who claim that timing change should be quote-unquote a lifetime part. That's absurd. All engines, all cars have weak links. Eventually, common parts fail. That's not the same thing as being a manufacturing or design defect. The bigger point here, perhaps, is the uniquely male obsession with engineering minutiae and the reduction of that minutiae into some binary conclusion that fails to stack up to robust analysis. As in, turbochargers, bad. Atmo induction, good. As in, timing belt, bad. Timing chain, good. That's just nuts. What matters in most cases is not the means of achieving the objective, but the calibre of the execution. In other words, if you're an engineer, you've got an engine on the drawing board and a budget to work with, right? What you need to do is deliver the required performance, the power, the torque, the revs, the fuel consumption, etc. And you can achieve that in dozens of different possible ways. If you do good R&D ultimately, then you'd achieve all the performance that you need, and you also get durability. But if you do shit R&D, then you'll probably get the performance minus the durability. This is also true of transmissions, driveline components, electronics. Every system in the car is vulnerable to shoddy engineering, right? Ford's uh, power shit transmission is a classic example of this. Great when it's working, but it breaks too often. There's nothing wrong with dual clutch transmissions generally, but if they're executed poorly, as in this case, by designing a clutch pack that fails because it cannot dissipate the heat generated by its own operation, then you're certainly in the epicentre of a shitstorm of consumer dissatisfaction brought on by shoddy engineering. You can design reliable dual clutch transmissions, reliable turbocharged engines, reliable timing belt engines, turbos for example, well they place great demands on engine oils because they get very hot 
and they operate at extremely high rotational rates. And that imposes servicing responsibilities on owners. There's no doubt about that. Frequent servicing, high quality oil, stuff like that. Complexity is the enemy of reliability. More complex systems have many more failure modes than simple systems, that's pretty obvious. But it is possible to block the failure pathways through smart maintenance and good initial R&D. In engineering R&D centers, it's hell on earth, right? Engines are routinely cycled for hundreds of hours between peak power and peak torque. It's much more savage than what you can do as an owner. You can't impose that savagery out there on the road. You cannot drive as hard as they treat engines in R&D. Although if you only do short trips and you blow the service interval out to infinity, in a sense you are being even more harsh or stupid. I guess what I'm saying here is that the issue of engineering detail has much more to do with the quality of the execution than merely some arbitrary judgment based on the parts list. There's also a charming piece of confirmation bias in operation, an online undercurrent out there, to the effect of older cars were simpler and therefore better, and therefore new cars are shit. Aside from performing worse, drinking more fuel, being death traps, requiring much more maintenance, breaking down more often and wearing out faster. Aside from that, older cars were definitely better. And I guess the other thing to bear in mind is the second law of thermodynamics. Everything wears out. Engines start out really precise, but entropy goes to work on them too. Maintenance is a hedge, but it is not indefinitely so. If you get 150,000 or 200,000 kilometres out of a car, those engineers have done a cracking job. The wheels have rotated more than 100 million times. The pistons have been up and down in those bores billions of times. The engine has been in maybe 10,000 complete temperature cycles. It's magic, proper witchcraft, sorcery, whatever. We just call it engineering because we know how it works. It's not magic if you know the underlying trick. I get it that it's frustrating if your car lets you down, but the flip side is, in most cases, look at how remarkably reliable it's been statistically. Except if you bought a Volkswagen or a Jeep, obviously. I'm John Cadogan, thanks for watching. <laughs>